Recording will start soon. Uh, there we are. We are commencing the uh, the recording, and we'll start presenting uh, one of these here. And here we are. Uh, so today I just want to overview the. Uh, sorry, that's the cat putting. Uh, that was the cat putting her uh, her paw on the keyboard. Hello, cat. Nice kitty. Um, I just want to overview the Arthropoda, um, a phylum with over a million known species, uh, one of the most uh, diverse, the single most diverse by a very wide margin of animal phyla, and one that includes a lot of parasites as well as you know every other niche you can think of. Um, over a million described, about three quarters of all known animal species are arthropods. There are marine arthropods, there are freshwater, there are terrestrial arthropods. Uh, that was the cat getting picked up and, oh. Sorry, my wife has just cat bombed us. No, please don't put her on the keyboard. I wasn't gonna put her on the keyboard. <laughs> she doesn't like that. <laughs> that was adorable. Yeah. Oh, she's hilarious. Mm -hmm. I was trying to get her to get off the table. Right. And of course, they not only conquered the seas, the fresh waters, and the land, uh, also the air. Uh, the only invertebrates capable of sustained powered flight are insects, although uh, some of the uh, jet propelled squid can actually uh, get close. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry to interrupt, but I'm going to let you know that I'm about to release the Kraken. You're about to release the Holy Terror? Yeah. I'm okay, they've seen him before. They're they're used to what might happen. He's sneaky as a jaybird at the moment. So okay, well, tell him tell him not to come not to come by here. See if I can get some clothes on him before he comes in here. And right. I'm sorry. Okay. Right. Um, body plan of arthropods is they're covered in a cuticle uh, that is reinforced with a carbohydrate polymer called chitin. Uh, depending on how much reinforcement there is, this can be uh, almost tissue paper thin uh, or extremely crunchy, as you know if you've ever, ever bitten the head off a cockroach. Yeah. Um, uh, this periodically has to be molted. Uh, like nematodes and other ecdysozoans, these have to shed the cuticle periodically. Uh, in many of them, the cuticle is strengthened with calcium carbonate. Uh, so the shell of a crab or a lobster, uh, for example, uh, is reinforced with a lot of CaCO3, so it may be very stiff. Uh, whereas at the same time, uh, the cuticle that is, let's say, in between joints um, or the cuticle that covers the gills where gas exchange has to happen uh, might be extremely thin. Uh, so arthropods periodically have to molt this, and the growth stage between molts is called an instar. Uh, so we'll talk about, you know, a first instar larva or a second instar larva or a, um, you know, fourth instar juvenile or whatever it might be. Uh, arthropoda means jointed leg. Uh, the appendages are jointed, and they're moved by muscles that attach internal to the leg. Um, if you think about your own muscle, yours are attached to bones and they're on the outside of the bones. Your muscles are outside of what they pull on. Uh, that would be extrinsic musculature. Uh, with insects, the muscles are inside the exoskeleton, which is what they pull on. So it would be the difference between a marionette, you know, where the strings are on the outside of the, the puppet legs and some kind of puppet where the strings are, you know, mounted on the inside of hollow legs. That would be extrinsic. That would be intrinsic musculature. I think that made that made sense in my head. Uh, the muscles usually attach to these foldings in of the exoskeleton that are called apodemes. Um, when I was a tender young undergrad like yourselves. Uh, we went one night to Red Lobster, um, 
which is part of why I think you shouldn't eat seafood if you can't see the uh, ocean that it came from, uh, because the seafood at Red Lobster is not really the best when the Red Lobster is in Springfield, Missouri. Um, but we got crab legs, and uh, I had one, and I cracked it open, and I kind of, you know, pulled out the meat, and there was this pair of little tendon things that were sticking out of the uh, broken end of the crab leg, and I just learned about this in my own undergraduate classes, so I started pulling on these little tendon things, and the leg would bend if I pulled one, and it would bend the other way if I pulled the other, you know, so I'm doing this whole little puppet show by tugging on the apodemes of a steamed crab leg, and uh, I think kind of freaked everybody out in the restaurant. I don't think anybody wanted to sit next to us. Uh, but yeah, you can demonstrate apodemes easily if you get, you know, steamed king crab legs and uh, uh, pick the muscle out of one of the segments. You may be able to find the apodemes and pull on them and do this little puppet show. Um, at least when you can go back to restaurants, that might be a fun thing to do. So might be a while. Uh, right, the bodies are segmented, and in something like a centipede or a millipede, the segments are all the same, and the body is just one long chain of segments. But in most arthropods, adjacent segments tend to group together into these larger units. Uh, insects, for example, have a head, uh, which I think is at least five segments that group together and a uh, thorax, which is made of three segments that are grouped together. That's where the wings and the legs come from. And an abdomen, which I think is made of 11 segments, but they're not all externally visible. Some of them get kind of tucked in during development. Uh, if you look at a spider, uh, there's two units, uh, a head and an abdomen, or if you want the technical correct words, a prosoma and an epistosoma. And each of those is made of a certain number of segments that glom together to make this subunit of the body. Uh, the way that segments group together to make those subunits is called tagmosis. And it's one of the things that makes arthropods so evolutionarily flexible. Different groups will clump segments together in different ways. That cuticle varies a lot in detail. Typically, there's an outermost layer called epicuticle. In insects, this is coated with uh, lipids and waxes. You know, that's why, you know, some arthropods feel very waxy to the touch. There are even certain insects that can be boiled down uh, to make this waxy uh, covering called shellac. Um, authentic shellac is made up of boiled scale insects. Like you really wanted to know that. What's that? Candy. What kind of candy? All the shiny candy. Oh, shiny candy is covered with insect secretions? Yeah. Cool. They're shellac. Okay, I did not realize that. Okay, yeah, shiny candy is apparently shellac. So whenever you eat a nice shiny piece of candy, you're basically eating a uh, rendered bug epicuticle. I'm sure you're really happy to know that. Okay. All right. Uh, there's a middle layer, the, ex the exocuticle. Uh, the inner endocuticle is made of proteins and chitin. Uh, below that is where you get that cellular layer that you see in the diagram on the left. Uh, the cuticle may be flexible or proteins in the cuticle might cross-link. And when you take a bunch of proteins and you cross-link them to make something tougher, it's called tanning. Uh, this is what you do to, uh, you know, animal skin to turn it into leather. And an analogous process goes on in insect cuticle. Um, and that tanning or sclerotization can make the cuticle stiffer. So this is why cuticle can vary um, in different parts of the same arthropod from very soft and flexible uh, to very hard and firm. And then, as I mentioned, some can make the cuticle even harder by depositing calcium carbonate salts in it. Ding. 
At molting time, that endocuticle detaches from that cellular layer. That's the epithelium. Uh, molting gland secretes some enzymes that break the old endocuticle down, and they secrete new cuticle from underneath. And those diagrams show how the process works. Uh, that new epicuticle, as it's being secreted, sclerotizes very quickly, uh, which keeps it from being digested by the same enzymes that are breaking the old cuticle down. So that's more or less what it looks like when an arthropod molts. And then once you've done that, the epicuticle breaks along lines of weakness and the arthropod sheds it. Um, I forget what arthropod this is. This is just one I picked where you can see uh, the new arthropod, which is white, um, moving out of its old discarded brown uh, tanned um, uh, cuticle right there. Uh, and the animal might inflate itself and stretch its new cuticle a bit uh, before those proteins can cross-link and sclerotize the whole thing. Hey, There's a diagram of an arthropod that shows that intrinsic leg musculature. I don't think it's going to come up too much in this lecture um, or in... in I don't think it's going to come up too much in this class, but some arthropods have appendages that have only a single branch. Uh, that's called being uniramus. Um, and some have two branches, which is called biramus. Um, what I want you to see here is how you have these muscles that attach to uh, the cuticle of the body uh, that pass into the leg. Um, and, of course, when they contract, they'll pull on the leg from the inside from one direction or the other. Uh, that's the best picture I could find of an apodeme. Um, it's that bluish stained thing kind of in the middle. You can see muscle fibers uh, that are attached to it, uh, both from uh, the top and from the bottom. Uh, that's an apodeme, and that's what the uh, muscles attach to. The apodemes can work like your Achilles tendon does, for example, storing elastic energy, you know, acting like a spring uh, when you walk and saving you, you know, saving you a certain amount of energy because they can store it and release it and they give your muscles just a little bit less to do. And then different arrangements of the muscle fibers pulling on the apodemes can optimize either speed or power. Um, you can, kind of like the fibers in your own muscle, you can arrange them as all parallel, or you can make them form kind of V shapes, uh, like the deltoid muscle in your shoulder, which I think gives you um, a little less speed, but a little bit more power to it. Uh, insects can do interesting things with muscle fiber arrangement as well. And then there's tagmosis, different arthropod body plans evolved by grouping segments together, uh, specializing some segments for certain functions, um, maybe enlarging some and reducing others. Uh, this is a little oversimplified, but it's roughly how we got insects uh, from an ancestor that may not have been a centipede, but would have looked kind of like one, that thing in the middle that says myriapod. Uh, the common ancestor of insects would have had, you know, all of its segments mostly identical. And then from there to a wingless early insect to something like a fly, these blocks of segments cluster together. Uh, they may lose, um, they may no longer be visible as separate segments from the outside. And these larger units, like the head, the thorax, and the abdomen of an insect, are called tagmata. And the process of how they evolve is tagmosis. I always thought tagmosis um, was, you know, what Moses' playmates used to say when he was a kid. They were playing together. They'd say, tag, Moses! And Moses would go, tag, Pharaoh, or, you know, whatever. 
Okay, that happens to be a scorpion. Uh, the head is made up of six segments. Uh, you can't really see those segment boundaries from the outside. Uh, the, the head, or the prosoma, as it's called, is that kind of trapezoid-shaped thing up on the front. Uh, you can't see outwardly that it's made of separate segments, but each segment bears one pair of appendages. And so that prosoma has four pairs of walking legs, uh, one pair of claws, and then up at the very front, you've got a pair of little pincers uh, called the chila, um, right around the mouth that actually process the, uh, uh, the food. So you've got a pair of... Um, little claws right at the front, and then the first big pair that you can easily see uh, is uh, the second pair, and then you've got four pairs of walking legs. Um, and then back of that prosoma, you've got six segments that make up the mesosoma, that's the main body of the scorpion, and then six segments plus that last little bit, the stinger, which is on a part called a telson that's technically not a segment, uh, makes up the metasoma. So don't memorize those particular details. We're not going to talk much about scorpions here, but this is just an example of tagmosis patterns in one particular group of arthropods. This is how tagmosis works. Um, and this is an arthropod that instead of having six segments in his head, he's got five uh, because he's not an arachnid like the scorpion. Uh, he's a crustacean uh, because he's a spiny lobster. And different tagmosis patterns are distinctive for different groups of arthropods. Many arthropods have biramus appendages. Um, Crustaceans do, but it's not immediately obvious for most of them unless you dissect them. If you were to dissect a crawfish, for example, uh, they've got five pairs of walking legs, but each leg also has a branch that's very thin and flexible and functions as a gill. Hello, cat. But you can't see the... Um, uh, you can't see these branches unless you remove the carapace. Uh, they're not visible externally. Uh, but biramus appendages are made of an upper and lower branch. If you must know, they're called the exapod and the endopod. Uh, insects don't have this. They've got uniramus appendages. Um, arachnids used to have biramus appendages, but most traces of that have been lost. Uh, so this scheme can be modified a lot by evolution. So yeah, in many aquatic arthropods, that's a cross-section through a crab, but you'd see the same thing in a crawfish or a lobster. Uh, one of the branches is for walking, and the other branch uh, forms this very flexible, kind of feather-looking uh, gill which is typically tucked up under the carapace and doesn't just go flapping around in the breeze. Uh, on some microscopic uh, arthropods, the two branches might be easier to see, but in big ones, that gill branch uh, tends to be hidden. So crustaceans respire with their gills. In insects and probably convergently in millipedes and in mites, um, instead of breathing through gills, uh, they breathe through holes in the body called spiracles. Um, I know you've heard of spiracles. Yeah, they were led by Smokey Robinson, I think. No, that's why soap will kill. Spraying soap on bugs will kill. Oh, cool. My wife reminds me that you can kill bugs by spraying them with soap uh, because the soap films will block the spiracles. Uh, and the spiracles lead into uh, air breathing tubes called the tracheae, uh, which some of you guys saw when we did the cockroach dissection a million years ago back in January. Um, it seems like a million years ago. But yeah, if you remember those white silvery branching tubes, 
I know I pointed them out to, to several people. Uh, those are the tracheae, and that's the main organ of gas exchange. Uh, that's a horseshoe crab, uh, elegant and beautiful creatures uh, that uh, you can find on the Gulf and Atlantic coasts. And the ancestors of horseshoe crabs had biramous appendages. Uh, what's happened now is that the appendages on the front of the body, in the, the prosoma, that front division of the body, uh, have lost the gill branch, and they function only for walking and for picking up food. And then in the back half of the body, the epistosoma, the endopod, the walking branch has been lost. And what's left is those exopods that form these flap-like structures called book gills, because they look, if you're on drugs, like uh, pages of a book. So this is perhaps not really critical to know for our purposes in this course, but I want you to see that having that dual branched appendage is another reason why arthropods are so diverse and so flexible uh, because you can modify one branch or the other branch. You can lose one branch or the other. There's lots of different things you can do with that kind of design. And then spiders and scorpions actually retain those book gills, but they cover them up with a flap of exoskeleton and uh, create what are called book lungs. That's a cross-section through a spider abdomen uh, showing these very thin, just one cell thin, um, leaf-like uh, respiratory structures. Um, and in these arachnids, you'll have spiracles as well, but they don't open into trachea as they open into the book lungs. Okay, so the spiracle there would be that little hole uh, down at the lower right that I think is marked with the number one. Thing. So our, I'm almost done. Our major players here are chelicerates among living arthropods. There's also trilobites and things like that. Yeah, I like trilobites. They're extinct, but they're really cool. Chelicerates would include, the ones you would know include horseshoe crabs, uh, but also spiders, scorpions, uh, daddy long legs uh, in a group called the Apiliones, uh, some others that you might encounter in uh, the desert like uh, solifugids and vinegaroons and things like that. And um, then the subgroup of chelicerates that includes most of the parasitic members is the acari, uh, one of the most diverse arthropod groups. Acari includes ticks, and it also includes mites, uh, which are a lot smaller. There's lots and lots of free-living mites out there, but there's a number that are parasitic. Um, Abby and Nick, I'm sure you know scabies mites and ear mites. Um, anybody that knows any beekeepers uh, might have heard of varroa mites. They're a parasite on honeybees. Uh, there's also, um, there's an awful lot of mites that are plant parasites, but there's a number that are parasites of animals too. We'll cover those guys soon. Myriapoda includes centipedes and millipedes, and as far as I know, there aren't any parasitic species of those. Crustacea is the most diverse group in the oceans, and that includes crabs and shrimp or, and lobsters and crawfish are the ones you would immediately know. Uh, there's also brine shrimp and gammarids and a ridiculous number of free-living species. Uh, one that's been modified so much for parasitic, um, a parasitic lifestyle that it's not obvious that it's even a crustacean includes a, a group called the pentastomids, aka the tongue worms. They don't normally parasitize humans. Uh, they tend to like living in places like snake lungs because somebody's got to. A uh, group called the Copapoda includes lots of free-living members. Copapods are very important in the oceans. 
Uh, we get copepods in freshwater as well. Pond water will have a lot of them, but there's also a lot of parasitic copepods. Uh, the same is true for the isopods. Uh, the best known isopods to you would be roly polies or pill bugs. Uh, roly polies actually belong to the crustaceans, but they've adapted to land life. There's lots of free living isopods in the oceans, but there's also a number of parasites, including this really cool one called Cymothoe exigua that swims into a fish mouth bites onto its tongue, uh, taps into the blood vessel, makes the tongue wither away, uh, but basically is the same shape as the fish's tongue, so the fish just ends up using it uh, in place of a tongue, uh, which is really kind of horrifying, but you can look this up if you want to. Another group, uh, Cirripedia, includes the barnacles, most of which are free living, but there's some really weird parasites, including the rhizocephala, which somebody really ought to make a horror movie about, uh, because if they parasitize people, they'd be the creepiest thing you've ever freaking heard of. And then finally, uh, branchiura uh, show up in freshwater around here. In fact, um, Reed Adams and some of his students actually did a project on them that's described in one of the posters that's still hanging in Lewis, and hopefully you can go look at it in the fall, some of you. Uh, Branchiera are affectionately known as fish lice. Uh, they're not true lice. True lice are insects, but they're mostly ectoparasites of, uh, of fish. Uh, plenty of them in freshwater ecosystems. And then the hexapoda includes insects as well as some kin that are technically not in the insects, uh, like springtails, columbola, uh, springtails in this group called the columbola, uh, things like that. And aside from lots of free living insects, you know the siphonaptera, uh, that's the fleas. Anaplura includes the sucking lice. And then a group that doesn't infect uh, humans and is by far most diverse on birds, uh, the malophaga, is the chewing lice uh, that mostly feed on dead skin and feathers but don't pierce and suck blood. Uh, this really bizarre group called the strepsipterans, aka the twisted wing parasites, um, that are also downright creepy because the females spend their entire lives as larvae. Uh, yeah, we'll talk about those guys later. And then the ones that include a lot of free-living members are Diptera and Hymenoptera. Diptera is the true flies. Lots of those are free-living. Many of them are micro-predators like horseflies and mosquitoes. There's also a few of them that are more permanent parasites a family of flies called the Hippoboscidae uh, spend their entire lives or most of their lives on a, uh, on a host. This includes deer flies. Um, one species that's a parasite of sheep is affectionately known as Keds. And yes, that's also the name for a brand of kid shoe. I don't know why. Uh, but... Uh, yeah, Abby and Nick, you might encounter these at some point. I don't know if you do much sheep practice, uh, but you might en encounter these at some point if you do large large animals. Uh, and there's bot flies and things like that that have a more permanent relationship with a host. And then finally, Hymenoptera is wasp, bees, and ants. And one particular family within the Hymenoptera includes a group called parasitoid wasps, which are technically not parasites because they kill the host. Oh, bring them in here. Yeah, my, um, can you see the, the stuffed chicken? Yes, hello. Hello, you very confused chicken. Yes, lovely. All right. Uh, right, okay. And we'll talk about those parasitoids later. 
uh, you'll love them. Uh, the life cycle of the um, aliens in the movie Alien, you know, the xenomorphs, uh, was basically based on uh, parasitoid wasps. And they do some pretty horrifying things. So uh, that would appear to be that. Any questions? Yes, I have a chicken. I'll check the uh, uh, check the chat logs. Say again. Okay, right. I'm uh, okay. All right, I'm going to go ahead and stop recording.